watching. Trust the force. Rogue One is a great homage to Star Wars, not only to the original trilogy, but also to the prequels, the television series, and even to the old, discarded expanded universe. Rogue One is crammed with references and allusions to all of it, sometimes more obvious and sometimes less. Here are some of the slightly less obvious cameos and cross-references that can be easily overlooked when watching the film, or at least give the devoted viewer a deja vu, something you have seen without knowing that you have seen it. Most of the cameos are from characters that old Star Wars fans recognize immediately, even if one of the names does not directly come to mind. As with General Dodonna, whose role in the briefing room in Episode 4 was only marginally greater than in Rogue One. But they did not pass on that opportunity and even cast the role more prominently than they could have. It is none other than Sir Barristan Selmy, the best swordsman of the Seven Kingdoms in Game of Thrones. Even now I could cut through the five of you like carving a cake. Here, boy. Melt it down and add it to the others. Also in the category of small role but interesting casting falls Mon Mothma. The mother of the Rebel Alliance is celebrating her first return to the cinematic universe after episode 6. This is notably special because she actually already returned in episode 3 before George Lucas cut her out of the movie again. And it is especially outstanding because Genevieve O'Reilly, the same actress, still embodies her role 10 years later. Casting by similarity alone does not always work. This is the case with CGI Leia and CGI Tarkin. CGI, computer generated imagery, is a relative term, because for the technique used in the movie you still need stand-ins, which at least resemble the originals and at the same time imitate them perfectly. Legendary actor Peter Cushing once brought Grand Moff Tarkin to life with his distinctive appearance. British actor Guy Henry does not only look like him, but also lends his own voice, with stunning similarity to Cushing's unmistakable accent. The regional governors now have direct control over their territories. While Guy Henry is most known for playing the treacherous sorcerer in the last two Harry Potter films, Leia's double, the rather unknown Norwegian Ingvild Dila, primarily had to look similar to the original Princess of Alderaan. Because the voice heard in Rogue One is taken from archive material and we're actually listening to deceased Carrie Fisher's own voice. I copy, Gold Leader. Returning for the target shaft now. We're in position. I'm going to cut across the axis and try and draw their fire. The trick with archive material did not only work for Leia. The two X-Wing squad leaders, Red Leader and Gold Leader, were also brought back into the Rebel Alliance with previously unused archive material. Red 5 standing by. When Luke Skywalker joins the Red Squadron in Episode 4, his identification is Red 5. Rogue One shows us that this identification did not just came out of nowhere. The prior Red 5 gets actually blown into pieces during the battle for Scarif. He seems to shine through absence, but you can spot him if you listen closely. Luke's future colleague and friend Wedge Antilles, in the old trilogy played by Dennis Lawson. His voice got dubbed in episode 4 in order to cover up his British accent. In Rogue One, however, you can hear exactly that voice on the radio. For this original voice, David Ancrum was dragged in front of the microphone. This is love for detail. Thanks, Wedge. Good shooting, Wedge. Captain Antilles. Yes, Your Highness. I'm placing these droids in your care. Treat them well, clean them up, have the protocol droids mind wiped. What? Unrelated to Wedge Antilles is Captain Ramus Antilles. Ramus Antilles gets instructed by another returner from Episode 3, Bail Organa. Captain Antilles is also known for a little convincing lie. We intercepted no transmissions. Uh, uh, this is a consular ship. We're on a diplomatic mission. If this is a consular ship, where is the ambassador? <laughs> In addition to C-3PO played by Anthony Daniels, there is only one other person who was in front of the camera in all three trilogies plus Rogue One. Fan favorite actor Warwick Davis. 
here with his best mask ever. And surprise, surprise, Warwick Davis will also return in episode 8, directed by Ryan Johnson. And just like Gareth Edwards and J.J. Abrams before him, Johnson belongs to this new generation of filmmakers that grew up with Star Wars and are now allowed to direct their childhood dreams themselves. He and his producer Ram Bergman are operating the laser of the Death Star in the film, and again without railings, which seems anything but secure. Also anchored in episode 4 and anything but subtle is the cameo of Panda Baba and Dr. Cornelius Avazan. Believe it or not, this doctor actually has got his doctor's degree in cosmetic surgery. We wanted men. I have the death sentence on 12 systems. I'll be careful. One may ask oneself whether Jeddah, or what is left of it, belongs to the 12 systems on which he is sentenced to death. After all, the easily provoked criminals at least use aliases for their own security. Rufu and Saki. <laughs> This fact surfaced from the official visual guide to the film. Rogue One stays true to the old tradition of Star Wars by showing new background information of the film itself and of reinterlacing known information. This also applies to the Star Wars Rebel series. The brief appearance of the series ship Ghost and of R2 equivalent Chopper in the background on Yavin 4 suggests that Rebels will sooner or later culminate in the first big test of the Rebel Alliance, the Battle for Scarif. It remains to be seen whether the battle will be the big finale of the show or one big highlight as an intermediate step in a long journey. The fact that Rogue One and Rebels have overlapping storylines is also evident in a cameo by Saw Gerrera, who once had his origin in Clone Wars and meets his demise in Rogue One, marked from the Guerrilla War. We also meet a younger, bald-headed version of the character in later episodes of Star Wars Rebels. This interlacing of film and expanded universe also becomes very clear by a space cruiser of the Hammerhead class. These cruisers were already used in the old Sith Wars and are familiar to fans from the old Republic video games. Now they finally celebrate their return into the official Star Wars canon, although they still exist in the Old Republic. Rogue One brings back a lot of material marked as legends, and with it a self-evidentness which may not necessarily have been expected in such a blockbuster aimed at a broad audience. The same can be said about the reintroduction of Darth Vader. One of the reasons why a lot of speculation was going on about the Bacta tank seen in the trailer was the presence of the palace guards. According to the old canon, they only protect the Emperor. Rogue One takes the artistic license to adjust the established canon in favor of an impressive scene. The fact that we are in Vader's personal fortress in this scene corresponds to the old expanded universe. Only instead of the acid gnaught planet Vijun, this is a planet that the film does not refer to by a particular name. And as we know now, it is because we already know the planet, Mustafar, the planet on which Anakin Skywalker hit rock bottom. Vader now retreats to Mustafar for rest and recreation. At the same time, the planet is a constant reminder of how he became what he is now. Don't make me kill you. Mustafar also helps him to keep his anger and grief by reminding him of the moment when he was burned alive. Rogue One does not just take extensive use in both the discarded and the current expanded universe, but also creates something great and unique out of it. Not for the sake of a nod, but for its own characters and their story.